Hey everyone, if you can hear me, go ahead and let me know. We're gonna start in just about 30 seconds. Great, okay, good, so it does work, awesome. Last webinar I did, I didn't put it on private and we uh, had all sorts of confusion, so today it's gonna be a lot more organized. I can see all the comments over to the right. We have 1,700 people on this webinar, and so we're gonna get started on time. Uh, we do have a um, kind of a guest coming in, I'll wait for her to log on. Hopefully that will work, but I wanted to use her as a demonstration of what we're gonna talk about. So in this webinar, we are going to talk about the digestive system, nutrient absorption. This is a, um, a, a topic that needs to be covered um, first before you get into anything else, simply because if you can't digest, you can't heal. So. It's very important to understand the basics. I want to cover a, a tremendous amount of information. Hopefully, I won't overload you. Um, but if there's anything as we go through uh, that is confusing, stop me and we'll clarify it. Uh, but I will um, give you some answers to your questions as we go through this. Um, the purpose of food is to, um, to extract nutrients. The purpose of eating is to extract nutrients from our food. And we have two problems, knowing how to get our nutrients, and number two, uh, being able to digest the nutrients. So when that occurs, we want to make sure that you understand any type of indicators or symptoms of the digestive system and what those mean. So we're going to really talk about the cause and effect relationship between um, what heartburn means, GERD means, uh, bloating, and all these things. So then you can understand what, what it means and what you're deficient in and what is blocking your nutrients. So um, and there's some questions about leaky gut. We'll talk about that. Infl inflammatory conditions of the bowel. We'll get into a lot of things. So uh, I just happen to have uh, my friendly PowerPoint slide. So let me just um, let me just pop this in there. Should work, and it does work. Awesome. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about. <clears throat> And it's kind of weird because I'm looking at the screen. I should be looking at the video camera at you. <clears throat> but um, so I'm always looking down. So I'm just trying to look at what I'm doing here. Okay, digestion, absorption of nutrients. So there's four main areas that we're going to talk about. And we're going to start about this start, start at the stomach level. The stomach, uh, basically, the simplicity of it, it does several things. Uh, primarily, it helps break down proteins. Um, so that's where most of the protein is digested. It has a unique function of breaking down collagen. Yeah, collagen. So when you eat um, meat and, um, and it has those little layers of tendons and things like that, well, collagen is absorbed and broken down in the stomach if your pH is between 1 and 3, which is very, very, very acid. Um, but that's normal. You need the pH to be one to three. And as we age, get into our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, we lose our stomach acids and our ability to digest collagen. So you see a lot of people with uh, all sorts of problems with their joints, ten I mean, the ligaments. I mean, think about what your body is made out of as far as collagen. You have uh, skin, you have tone of the skin, you have um, all the joints, connective tissue that holds everything together. You have ligaments around your bladder and you have the arteries that are all made of collagen. So the elasticity is controlled by that. So the stomach, uh, due to its strong acids, uh, triggers a very powerful enzyme called pepsin. And that enzyme helps you digest protein. It's a serious, seriously powerful enzyme that helps digest the protein. 
and but it's only triggered if the pH is between one and three. So you can see the problem with a lot of people if they cannot digest proteins. Um, the biggest symptom would be gas. Um, now, I could see if you eat beans or you eat something like fruit and you get gas. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you have protein, meat, and you can't digest it, you get gas. That would mean you don't have enough acid. Okay, so the stomach produces acid to break down proteins. Uh, it also helps us to um, absorb minerals. Um, these proteins that are broken down turn into what's called amino acids. Those are the small building blocks of protein. But if you think about what amino acids, I mean, that pretty much builds your entire body. Um, but I want to talk mainly about um, building up certain hormones and these hormone-like substances that travel through the nervous system called neurotransmitters. So in other words, those neurotransmitters are oh, – Veronica's here. Great. Hi, Veronica. Um, so, um, okay, so we want to, um, so neurotransmitters are basically those uh, proteins that go through the nervous system, and they're made by the adrenal gland, they're made by the brain, and I'm talking about specifically, um, okay, I just have to, okay, yes, I can hear you. Someone says they can't hear you, but they can hear me. Okay, good. So neurotransmitters, we have serotonin. Serotonin, without serotonin, guess what? You get depressed, you get anxiety. Uh, think about how many people are on psych drugs and they have a lot of digestive problems. There are more nerve endings in your digestive system there are, than there are in your spinal column. So you have tremendous connection between your brain and your stomach, all right? So, so we need a very strong acid to break down proteins, to absorb minerals, calcium, iron. If you're not absorbing iron, you get anemic. Um, and so those are the two big things that the stomach does. It, it kind of just incinerates everything and it gets the stomach, uh, the intestines ready to do the next level. So now here's the thing. There's a myth about the stomach, okay? Now, before I get into this myth, I want to um, talk to Veronica. Can you hear me, Veronica? Yes, I can. Okay. So um, your voice is a little bit quiet. Is, are you by a mic? Um, no, I'm not. Okay. Now, Veronica, uh, for four years, you've had heartburn, and it's been debilitating. Uh, you started having problems with... Um, acid reflux, and then the doctors kept giving you antacids over and over. And they, I think they told you that you had too much acid, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So she had too much acid, which that's the myth right there. Acid reflux is not too much acid. It's not enough acid. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so they told you that. And then what kind of what triggered that? Was it stress or did you take antibiotics? What triggered this uh, heartburn? Um, I'm going to say stress. Um, I have I do customer service, so it's been pretty stressful. And so most, um, I mean, I've noticed that as soon as um, I'm stressed, I start feeling, you know, like I'm getting acid. So stress and then just, um, um, I don't know if... Um, eating you know um i probably ate something that i was not supposed to like something spicy or um or something acidic so mm -hmm. so, um, this, so so you started to go to the doctor and he started giving antacids and it's this is this went on for four years right yes okay now um you started uh, basically losing weight because you couldn't eat yeah, I lost like seven pounds. Did you have any, uh -huh. Did you have any with other symptoms? I know you have you had a severe dry esophagus. Um, was there any other symptoms like I don't know fatigue, sleeping problems, uh, cramps in your your calves, um, twitching on your eyelid? Any of those? Um, I had a lot of problems. One of them was um, I was extremely dizzy every single day. I would wake up dizzy and then um even if i was just standing up i felt like i was in a boat 
um, pain on my the back of my you know just on my throat and um, back pain and back um, pain on my shoulders and um, not being able to sleep because my throat was extremely dried and um, I would eat anything and I can barely swallow it because I can I can feel the food getting stuck on my esophagus. Okay, so now that thank you for that introduction because now I can go on to the next part because what I want to cover um, is this right here. Let me just pop back in here. We'll come back to that. Is that um, um, you have breakdown of protein collagen? Now you're pretty young, so you probably haven't noticed a lot of collagen breakdown, but uh, absorbing absorbing minerals like electrolytes. So if you don't have electrolytes, you could feel dizzy. You can have salt cravings, you can have uh, cramps in your muscles, um, and also, well, let me just hold off. I don't want to jump into that, but now check this out. We have a pH scale between um, 0 and 14. Right in the middle, 7 is neutral. The higher you go with the numbers, the more you're alkaline, the lower the acid. So every number, whole number, you go from 7 to 6, that's by a factor of 10 times. So <clears throat> 6 is 10 times more acid than seven okay so it kind of compounds all right now here's the interesting thing that i really want to teach you guys so if you have some paper and notes just take notes i'm kind of summarizing summarizing all the most common problems that <clears throat> i run into in 25 years and i'm just going to summarize it in about 40 minutes get ready so the valve on top of your stomach that little valve that closes um, the acid, so let me pop to this, this little valve right here that stops the acid from going into the esophagus is controlled by your pH. That's right. So that valve, if that pH goes a little too alkaline, it will not close. Well, if you ever hear of GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disorder, that's basically the valve that doesn't close. So the acid splashes up into the esophagus. So in reality, acid reflux is not enough acid. So here they were giving Veronica all this anti-acids, uh, this thing called a proton inhibitor, which basically if you take hydrochloric acid, the HCl, the H is a hydrogen ion. Well, they block that from being absorbed, so they block the acids. So I can imagine, Veronica, you probably just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, now, as we go down the list, um, we have this thing right here, it's called the release of bile, B-I-L-E. I, I want to just spend a second talking about that. Bile is the um, kind of like the detergent that breaks down the grease. It's the thing that helps you digest fats. It helps you absorb healthy things from fats. And when we get into the gallbladder section, we'll cover more on that. But here's the thing you should know. Your pH, being very acid, is the trigger for bile. So guess what, Veronica, when you took these antacids, I could imagine your pH probably went up to about uh, four, five, six, and you didn't release bile. And so one of the symptoms that Veronica had was severe dry uh, mouth. I think it was esophagus. Was it dry eyes too or just the throat? Um, it was just on um, my throat. Um, and I can feel my, I mean, I would feel my esophagus extremely dry because my food would get stuck. Yeah. And that's a deficiency of the fat-soluble vitamins. Anytime you have dry eyes, dry skin, dry throat, dry mouth, that's not dehydration. That is a lack of oils, like fat-soluble vitamins, specifically vitamin A. So I told you to consume. What did, what did I tell you to eat? Um, you asked me to eat... Um, butter. Um, butter, yes. Yeah, okay. Carry Sorry. Gold. Kerrygold butter because that it's loaded with vitamin A. Yeah. Um, the other things that are really good with vitamin A are um, liver, which I know I can't stand it, but you know it's mm -hmm. that's one thing you can get your vitamin A. The problem with uh, vegetables, even kale has a lot of vitamin A. It's a pre-vitamin A, so it, it's only really like four percent of it's absorbed. So uh, if you are a vegetarian, you're going to be in trouble with that unless you can have maybe some grass-fed ghee, which is a type of butter to get your vitamin A. But vitamin A, which we'll get into in the next section, is important in a lot of a lot of things. Okay, so we have the pH needed being strong to make sure the valve closes, make sure you release bile, and release of those pancreatic enzymes. 
An enzyme is something that helps you um, do the work in breaking down food and converting it into body tissue. So enzymes either break stuff down or they build stuff up. So they break down your food and then they build back up the food into body tissue. That's what enzymes do. It's like the powerhouse. They're, they're quite magical because they seem to, um, they can be recycled, but they're triggered by certain things, especially pH and, uh, and hormones. Okay, so we need the pancreas. Like, like when you have certain foods um, in your mouth, as soon as you put it in your mouth, your pancreas picks up what food that is, and it's automatically generating a lot of enzymes for you to break down that food. So, I mean, you, here you eat meals with uh, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, fibers. Your body is generating enzymes ready so when that food gets through the stomach, it's ready to break all that down and it has all the enzymes. But if you're eating a lot of cooked foods, <laughs> you don't have the enzymes, so your pancreas has to work even harder. Um, people that like eat a lot of cooked foods, like roasted nuts, they don't eat raw, enough raw foods, especially like the roasted nuts, and they don't um, eat raw nuts. What happens is that their pancreas starts working harder, and it can enlarge by three times its size. And you can feel like a full sensation underneath the left rib cage. All right, the next thing is the full absorption of minerals, calcium, iron. Uh, all the minerals need to be in an acid pH. So if you're, like everyone's so focused on alkalizing the body, well, all they're doing is blocking the absorption of minerals. So guess what they're going to notice? Um, the first sign of a calcium deficiency is cramps in your lower calves. Yeah. Um, okay, also the last function of acid pH is to kill all potential microbes. If these microbes are not killed in the stomach level, um, they can enter the rest of the intestine and infect you, okay? Yeah, lovely. So the myth of acid reflux, indigestion, heartburn, and GERD is a problem of too much acid. No, it's actually not enough acid. If you look up acid reflux on Google, Oh my goodness, it's filled with all types of false information that you need to um, handle your, take an antacid, get rid of your acid, you know, change your foods, but they're not looking at the pH. Even when they do a test, they don't ever check for a pH. Um, so, I mean, you could check for a pH or you could simply acidify your body and, and solve the problem and not have to even do the test. Okay, so... That's, um, that's some basic data on the stomach, okay? So acid reflux means too little acid. Now, an ulcer means too little acid for too long period of time, and then you get a chronic irritation, and it just eats a hole through your, your uh, esophagus or stomach or even small intestine. So that's an ulcer, and an ulcer could be triggered by stress as well. GERD, too little acid. Gas is too little acid. So you think about this. If the stomach is not right, you can absorb minerals. You can't absorb amino acids. You can't absorb B12. Um, yeah, a lot of problems. Okay, what is the one of the root causes? Now, I want to ask Veronica, um, did you ever crave salt? Um, I actually did because, well, my mouth was extremely dry. So I was just craving um, tons of salt. But I was not eating salt, thinking maybe that was going to irritate my, my esophagus. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, so here's the thing. Um, one, of the, one of the things that if you're deficient in salt, <clears throat> you can create a low uh, – you can actually not make your HCL, your hydrochloric acid. So low-salt diets can create – an alkaline stomach or a low stomach acid. So what does the doctors tell you to do? Avoid salt. Big problem, especially as you age. Your body actually requires at least, at minimum, a thousand milligrams of salt a day. I'm sorry, a thousand milligrams of sodium. <laughs> um, but you need chloride as well. So that sodium, about say about uh, maybe an eighth, almost a fourth of a teaspoon of salt, that's how much we need. Of course, we have other minerals that require to balance that off. So um, that salt is necessary to build up your hydrochloric acid. Okay, so I want to answer just a couple little questions as we go here because I'm rattling off. Um, 
Some people are losing me. Some people are not. Um, okay. What if you don't have a pancreas? Wow. <laughs> then you have to take enzymes on a regular basis. That's a pretty serious situation because that pancreas is vi very vital. So you have to take enzymes. And uh, one of the things that you'll take is called uh, pancreatin, which is um, uh, a bunch of pancreatic enzymes. That's what you need to take. Okay, next question, Rachel. Cooking food too long kills off the valuable nutrients. Yes, it does, Rachel. So when you roast, you cook, you microwave, you kill off enzymes because enzymes are sensitive to heat. Um, how can stomach acid be so strong and that it's okay for the food? I'm not sure I answered that question, but it's normal for your stomach to be extremely acid. That's a normal process, okay? All right, so I answered two questions. I can go back to the webinar. Okay, so what causes uh, a low salt diet, aging, anti-acids? Now, in college, oh my gosh, did I have a problem? I had a problem with, um, let me just uh, pop me back in here. Stop screen sharing. Okay, so I had um, heartburn so bad in college, I would take the mega packs of Rolaids just over and over and over and over. I didn't know what to do but i was taking all the right st wrong things and i started getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and it's going to the doctor he says take any acids and i kept getting worse and i always had pain in my stomach little did i know um and I, that's when my gallbladder problem started because you need the acid to trigger the gallbladder or else you won't release the bile and you'll start getting pain right here and i had all this pain of course i was in chiropractic college so i actually had a million adjustments to my neck and everyone and their brother tried to get in there and work on me and adjust me and adjust me the right way, the wrong way. And um, it was, I was like a human guinea pig. Yeah. All right. Someone who has, a, uh, who has a problem with sodium causing edema and high blood pressure. Okay. So here's the thing. <clears throat> when, when you have edema, edema or you have too much sodium or whatever, high blood pressure, the thing to do is not to decrease the salt. It's to increase the opposing mineral. And that opposing mineral, does anyone know what the opposing mineral or the counter mineral to sodium is? Go ahead and tell me right now. I'm going to see if anyone can get it right. Okay. You guys are smart. Yeah. It's potassium. Potassium is the mineral that you need to um, balance out the sodium. So normally we need uh, about. 4,700 milligrams of potassium every single day uh, and only 1,000 milligrams of sodium. So all you have to do is increase. Yeah, you guys, you guys are sharp. Um, all you have to do is increase the potassium and the sodium will naturally, the fluid comes out. Because when you lower sodium, you're going to get dizzy like Veronica and you're going to feel dizzy because you need sodium for the adrenals to recharge. Those electrolytes are important in maintaining normal blood glucose. Why do you think when you get home at night when you're stressed, you need a little sweet and then you need a little salt and then a little sweet, sweet salt? You're trying to get the sodium and the glucose balanced. Um, so, yeah. Cindy says we're going to start soon. Oh, yeah, we already started. We already started the webinar. Okay, so now the next uh, slide I'm going to cover. Okay. All right. We talked about pepsin. You need that to digest collagen. Very important. Oh, yeah. Check this out. Now, the medical term for achlorhydria, that's the name for low stomach acids. Achlorhydria. You want to look it up, Wikipedia, dictionary, whatever. So, I mean, I don't know why they can't just say low stomach acids. So it sounds very uh, scientific. Achlorhydria. Well, check this out. If you look that up, one of the symptoms of achlorhydria low stomach acid is gastro gastroesophageal reflux disease. What does that mean? It means one of the symptoms is GERD. Hello? It's the cause of GERD. It's not the symptom. So, um, I mean, and then, of course, if you look up GERD as far as the treatment, they say take antacids. It doesn't make sense. It's just a big business, and unfortunately, a lot of people just, they assume they have too much acid and they take the wrong thing. So um, what they need to do is acidify the body okay and I'm getting to other 
the solution coming up here. So there's a, there's a remedy. It's called betaine hydrochloride. Betaine hydrochloride is a natural thing. It's made from beets. And that, it splits off with the um, hydrogen ion and the chlorides and helps you build stomach acid. That's a really good way to acidify your stomach. Um, and then taking pepsin too at the same time, that will really help acid reflux. Now with <clears throat> Veronica, it was so bad, we had to heal her stomach with chlorophyll first, right, Veronica? Yes, that's correct. So that gave her finally some relief after a couple of days. So if there's an also or severe irritation, chlorophyll. Now, um, wheatgrass juice in water is like pure chlorophyll. You could sip that and that will soothe and heal. That's what I, I use uh, for any type of chlorophyll type things. And then the other thing is you never, ever, ever, ever want to take calcium with meals. So if you're taking calcium, only take it before bed. Do not take it with a meal like three times a day um, because that will dilute the stomach acids. How do you know if you don't have enough acid? You have heartburn, indigestion, gas. So these three things are good solutions for that. Okay. So um, I'm going to answer a couple questions and then go right back to it. My dad has edema. I gave him potassium supplements, but his doctor was horrified and warned him not to take it due to his low-functioning kidneys. Oh, brother. Okay, so um, here's the thing. I had a guy come up to see me from Alabama. He was on kidney dialysis. And what we did, he wasn't supposed to take potassium. I'm like, fine, let's just get it from the food. Let's get it from the food. So he started eating a lot of vegetables and avocados. And um, he went back home, and his port was dry. And I actually have a, a recording of the successor I'll put on the website. And he basically, um, he, he was a veterinarian. He no longer needed that to go to kidney dialysis. And he, and potassium was a key thing. Of course, you don't want to take potassium if you have kidney disease as a supplement, but you can get it from the foods in small amounts and start to build the person up. I mean, that's really the, I mean, I don't know how you're going to heal these guys. with, Like, if they're have kidney disease and they're on medication, how, what is your options? What are you going to do? Not eat vegetables and just go down? No, I mean, that's, that's the problem. Okay. So apple cider vinegar, <clears throat> um, that's a very good idea to acidify the body. I really think that's a very smart idea. Now, can we calcium rich foods with a meal? Sure. That's not a problem. Mainly I'm talking about calcium supplements. Okay. I've been getting pain in my stomach two hours uh, before eating, but only when I consume alkaline foods. Bingo, ding, ding, ding. You need to acidify your stomach. That'll solve that. Um, what if I'm allergic to wheat? Well, first of all, you shouldn't be eating wheat in the first place So, um, because wheat is turns into sugar and it has gluten. Okay, good. So I'm going to go back to the seminar here or the webinar. Now we're going to get into my favorite topic called the gallbladder okay now i'm covering you know the gallbladder and liver are kind of connected they are connected actually and they work as a unit but i want to talk about the most common problems that you're going to run into so here's the symptoms of the gallbladder um number one you're going to get bloating when you eat now veronica did you have any bloating when you ate uh lots of bloating <laughs> did you have burping um, burping, not so much. Okay. But I did have a bit. Okay. <clears throat> so burping, bloating, belching, the need for sweets after a meal, like you're not satisfied. Why? Because you're not pulling in the fats to satisfy the brain. Um, constipation. Why? Because the bile lubricates the colon. See, the gallbladder is a sac that hangs underneath your liver and it stores bile Bile is made by the liver. It's stored by the gallbladder. And then every time you eat, the gallbladder squeezes the bile into the small intestine to help you break down food, uh, main, mainly fats. Okay? So it helps you extract nutrients from fats. Well, are there, are there nutrients in fats? Yes. Essential fatty acids. Um, those are things that like in fish oils, I mean, flax oil, um, all those really healthy oils that are anti-inflammatory. You also have... Um, fat-soluble vitamins, extraction of those, vitamin A, D, E, and K. 
Um, if you're low on vitamin D, it could be your gallbladder. Now, <clears throat> right shoulder pain, oh my gosh, that's classic gallbladder, uh, sore headaches. So anything on the right side, like the jaw, headache on the right side, the scapula on the right side, that's all gallbladder. And then the other thing that's fascinating is low thyroid function. Did you know that the thyroid converts T4 to T3 through the gallbladder and liver? So without a good gallbladder, you can't convert those hormones and you're gonna have thyroid symptoms and you'll take the thyroid medication. You will not feel any more energetic. You won't lose weight because your thyroid problem is secondary to a lack of bile. Veronica, did you ever, did you ever have cold feet? Did I ever have what, I'm sorry? Cold feet. Cold feet, um, cold. yes. Okay, yes, yeah. That's probably because your thyroid is not converting. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, your gallbladder is not converting the thyroid. 80% uh, of the thyroid function is controlled by the gallbladder and then liver, and then 20% is controlled by the, the kidneys. Now, high cholesterol. Cholesterol um, is broken down by bile. So if you don't have enough bile, your cholesterol can go higher. But there's other things that can cause high cholesterol. In some of the other webinars, we're going to cover cholesterol extensively. Gallstones. Gallstones purely are a lack of bile. What do the doctors do? Take out the gallbladder. Oh my gosh, now you're really going to get stones in your liver. So the way to dissolve gallstones is to take some purified bile salts. Floating stool. Floating stool is a symptom of lack of bile. Why? Because your stool is filled with fat and fat floats. Okay, so that's a good indication to know if... Uh, uh, you need bile. Another indication is light-colored stool and craving for fatty foods. Um, I don't know, Veronica, did you ever crave for deep-fried catfish or any type of fried anything? Yes. Uh, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. What a coincidence. Um, I used to have a gallbladder problem so bad, my grandmother, before she died, she gave me a... Um, let me just. She gave me um, this recipe for her famous meatloaf. Um, that was back in college. I don't eat meatloaf like they make it back then. So they, you actually added white bread to meatloaf. It's crazy. And then I didn't, I didn't read the directions fully. I, I just scanned it, and I missed the last little sentence where she said, "Make sure you drain all the grease." <laughs> from the pound of meatloaf. Well, let me tell you what happened. I consumed a pound of meatloaf with all of the grease soaked up in the bread. Now, could you imagine waking up in the middle of the night to try to, um, I mean, with this pain in your stomach, I didn't know what it was. I thought I was having a heart attack. I had no, I had, I had the absence of information, knowledge on health back then. And that was the start of my gallbladder problems. Okay, so let me just, See if there's any questions. Is it possible to have stones in your liver after the gallbladder is moved? Absolutely, because the stones a lot of times are made by the liver, and then they drop down into the gallbladder. Please elaborate on the need for sweets after meals. What that means is that your body is not uh, satisfying the brain to balance the blood sugars because your digestion is faulty. What you should do is uh, take a little purified bile salts, and that will help you absorb more of the fat. See. Fat is what satisfies you, stops the brain, stops the hunger. If you go on low-fat diets, it can really create a serious hunger craving problem. Okay, so let's see. I've been on a ketogenic diet for over a year, but these symptoms still, but these symptoms still persist. I fear taking betaine hydrochloride um, as I don't want to be knocked out of ketosis. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Guess what? Betaine hydrochloride will not knock you out of ketosis. No, it's not a carbohydrate. It's not sugar. Even though it's made from beets, it's not beets. So you can do betaine hydrochloride all day long. It will not be a problem. Okay, so now the next thing I want to talk about is um, itching. Let me just make sure that, um, okay, itching. Let me go back to the screen share right here. Okay. <clears throat> Veronica, I, I never asked you this, but did you ever have itching on your body? Yes. Okay. 
you had so many symptoms of this gallbladder. We've been we've probably been working on your stomach. We should probably now work on your gallbladder because the itching is a classic sign of a gall a, a, a gallbladder um, gall, basically bile deficiency. Now we get to the gallstones. Gallstones basically accumulate because you don't have enough bile because bile helps you break down the stones and then they get stuck in the duct and they can create a lot of pain, a lot of problems for you, right shoulder pain. Uh, it can be very miserable. Um, there's an herb called stone root that's very, very uh, effective against stones. Very, uh, no side effects, it's wonderful. Here are some gallbladder symptoms. Constipation, right shoulder pain, specifically the muscle right, if you could see this right here, I think you could see it, yeah. It's the muscle on the right upper trap. There's a muscle called the levator anguli scapula muscle. It goes from your neck to your little scapula right here, and that thing will be like a rope. You massage it, it never goes away. That is gallbladder. You should be pressing on the gallbladder. Now, Veronica, I, I never asked you this question. Did you have, do you have any um, like ropey neck muscles, tight upper back? Lots. That was one of the biggest issue I ha I have still. Um, that pain is just, um, and I've been going to get uh, massages, but it's just, I get it a lot. Yeah, because the problem is not in your upper trap, it's in your gallbladder. So you'll get, also you get bloating over the gallbladder and you get belching. Those are my images, so you could memorize them. So what is bile? Bile is a fluid that helps you break down fats and extract nutrients from the fat that you eat. There are healthy types of fats that you should eat, but you need the bile to be able to pull it in. So, you know, coconut oil, um, grass-fed cheese and butter and uh, meats uh, and eggs are all healthy fats. Yolk is very healthy. Um, but if you don't have bile, you'll get deficiencies of certain nutrients, okay? So the bile helps extract the healthy fats to pull out the essential fat, fatty acids and also to help you extract the fat-soluble vitamins. And that's really what I wanna spend a little time on because this right here is so common, yet there's not a lot of information out there, correct information. So what is a fat-soluble vitamin? It's it's a vitamin that gets uh, stored in your body, in your fat cells, so you can retain it a lot longer. And vitamin A, for example, here's a symptom. You get poor vision, especially at night, dry skin, acne. Why do you think they use Accutane? That's a synthetic uh, vitamin A, but it's very toxic. It has a lot of side effects. Um, sinusitis, because the vitamin A works to heal all the inner skin of the sinuses, of the throat, of the bronchial uh, tissue, um, the inner skin and on the eye as well, and the outer skin. So anything wrong with the inner and outer skin is a vitamin A deficiency. But you know what? It could be just, you just don't have the bile. Okay, that's vitamin A. Vitamin D3, check this out. Bone pain, loss of bone, depression, especially seasonal, asthma. Kids that go outside in the sun to get vitamin D uh, miraculously get rid of their asthma symptoms. Interesting. <clears throat> if I had asthma, I would take high levels of vitamin D and K2. We'll get into that in a second. Vitamin D is also helping with calcium metabolism and that vitamin D helps increase the absorption of calcium by 20 times in the intestine. So without vitamin D, you don't really absorb calcium. Okay, vitamin E. Vitamin E is pretty much the muscle cramp vitamin, and that includes not just your muscles, but your heart. Um, people that have angina, if they took a good whole food vitamin E complex, um, it's like taking nitroglycerin. It helps, helps chest pain and angina. That's chest pain, or the, the heart cramps. If you think about um, <clears throat> what causes a vitamin E deficiency, is by consuming a lot of refined wheat or grains, as in bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, muffins, sodas. Not sodas, not a wheat, but you know what I mean. So if you if you were taking like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and you still have muscle cramps, take vitamin E. That will get rid of it. 
um, if you go in <clears throat> high altitude uh, mountain climbing, if you look at the peak of every mountain top, you will see empty bottles of vitamin E. Why? Because it increases oxygen saturation of the heart muscle and the, the brain and the, ox and, the, um, and the blood. So it's really important in, in increasing oxygen carrying capacity. Also the sex hormones. Women that uh, go through menopause, a lot of times they lose the libido because the pituitary is where you store all the vitamin E. So if, you're, if you um, suddenly don't need the ovaries anymore and they stop working, then the pituitary doesn't have to work as hard and you dry up your vitamin E reserve um, that are supposed to build up those hormones. And so you therefore can have like no libido. That's a vitamin E deficiency. I mean, it can be other things too, but that's one. Now, vitamin K2, um, people know, I'm sorry, vitamin K1, people know that is like clotting and they, they're concerned because they don't want to take vitamin K because they don't want to get a, a stroke. Well, guess what? Vitamin K has about eight different um, categories or, or proteins that it uses to help balance clotting and thinning of the blood. So it's not just for clotting. There's a, a medication, Coumadin, which is rat poison that helps block vitamin K, and um, they can't consume vegetables. Well, the problem is that you need vitamin K to help regulate the consistency. So Again, I, I'm not going to go down that road right now because I don't want to get in trouble, but um, I'm just telling you, if you are put on Coumadin, you better do your research um, and then decide for yourself. But I want to talk about this vitamin K2. K2. This is kind of a new thing for people, but vitamin K2 is probably will be the, one of the most important vitamins in the next five years that people will start learning about and start taking. Why? Because it controls calcium. It controls and regulates the the soft tissue calcium. It transports the calcium from the wrong place in the arteries, in the brain, and the joints, and it puts it into the bone. Vitamin K2 will make your arteries elastic. I'll come back to that in a little bit. So here's vitamin A, acne, dry skin, sinus, can't see in the dark. Vitamin D, bone pain, depression, asthma, osteoporosis or osteopenia, vitamin E deficiency, heart cramps, um, cramps in your um, calves, and low oxygen, so you run out of gas real fast if you're exercising, so you have low recovery. Vitamin K2, I want to spend a little more time on this. <clears throat> There's a great website. It's called, vita it's called vitamink2.org. It has a lot of research that you can um, go into when you're spare time and learn about K2 in the research on elasticity. Um, if you have these spurs in your joints, like I do from trauma and injuries and um, accidents, falling off my bike in the on the cement, having surgeries for my arms and all that, um, you're gonna have a lot of um, uh, spurring and you're gonna have a lot of arthritis and uh, um, little type of <clears throat> calcium deposit. So guess what will help that? K2 and the combination of D3 and K2 together. Um, and what K2 will do is it prevents bone spurs. It prevents um, bunions. Why do you think people get this, these bunions? That's like a calcium deposit on your big toe. Um, there's also a condition called stenosis. That's when the spinal column is suddenly gets smaller. Well, guess what that is? That's calcium plugging up the, the spinal column. So you have kidney stones, gallstones, placking in the arteries, stiffness in the joints, arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis. All that is a lack of vitamin K2. If you don't have vitamin K2, your body basically turns into a stone. Let me get more into that. There's a, a way better test for heart risk uh, than, cal uh, than um, cholesterol. 50% of all people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol. It's really the calcium buildup on the arteries. That's why um, the arteries become stiff and then you will have a problem with high blood pressure and then eventually a stroke. But there's a test that can be done called the coronary artery calcium scoring. Um, and you do this test and they can look inside and see if your arteries are calcified. So 
Um, this is a way better predictor of heart attacks than cholesterol. Uh, a lot of the doctors um, don't want to, um, you know, they're not really flexible in their thinking. So they're, they're kind of, it's going to take a while before they accept this, but I'm not going to wait that long. Here's, here's another Time magazine so we know it's true. It says, predicting heart attack risks, a calcium test may help. And just for some of you that don't know me, I have a very dry sense of humor. It says right here, researchers looked at 950 patients with no symptoms of heart disease and found that patients with the presence of calcium, even with those of low cholesterol, had twice the risk of heart attacks or strokes and four times the risk of heart disease because the calcium is, when you take calcium um, without the right things, without vitamin K2, you can increase your chance of getting heart attacks. Here's another one. Use, users of calcium supplements had significantly, statistically significant increase in myocardial risk, which is um, heart attack. Um, amazing. Well, guess, <clears throat> now let's, uh, let's see if, what you guys, if you can get this right. Um, go ahead and answer this question, because I've been rambling on a long time. Um, tell me, what, where do you get vitamin K2? What foods have vitamin K2? I'm going to see if you guys get this right. And as you're typing, I'm going to answer some questions. Uh, can K2 help aortic stenosis? Absolutely. Check out the website and look into that area. You're going to find that it absolutely will help that. Uh, is K2 bad when your arteries are already too elastic? No. It's not going to make it worse. Okay. Need to take board money. Uh, more vitamin A, but reluctant to try carrot juice. Well, I wouldn't get my vitamin A from carrots. I would get my vitamin A from animal fat. I would consume um, grass-fed butter, things like that. Okay, so some of you, uh, it's kind of a mix. <clears throat> some of you are saying uh, kale. Um, there is no uh, K2 in kale. You're thinking of K1, okay? Vitamin K2 is different than K1, but some of you had this correct. So let's go back and show you my slide. Uh, let me find my PowerPoint. Okay, there it is right there. Okay, so check this out. We get it from grass-fed products, okay? <clears throat> See, the K1 is in the grass. The cows eat the grass. They convert the K1 and the K2. You may eat the milk, the kefir, the yogurt, the cheese, uh, the beef, um, the eggs from the chicken who hopefully eats some grass, and then that's how you get it. That's how you get K2. You can have a vegetarian source uh, through, it's called NATO, and that's the supplement I use. It's a, it's a type of um, non-GMO um, fermented soy product in Japan. It's called NATO, and that's the one I use because it's a it's a version MK7, which is a natural version. I like it better than synthetic. But the point is that you get it from the grass-fed animal products. But you might say, well, I eat cheese, I eat milk. Yeah, but you probably don't realize that um, most – it when you buy beef or, um, or any type of yogurt or cheese or butter, you have to read the label. It has to say grass-fed because if it's not, man, it's um, soy and corn-fed. I just did an interview of a farmer who is a patient, and he said most of the farmers nowadays um, uh, plant koi, uh, corn and soy, and 90% of it is shipped off to the animals. So that's what they get to eat. And unfortunately, it's all GMO, and it really destroys the digestive system of these animals. So it's really, really bad. I wanted to show you real quick on, on a lot of the problems that happen with too much calcium, soft tissue calcium. One you get um, calcification of the arteries, so you're going to get arrhythmias. Why do you think some of the medications they use for the heart and high blood pressure are called calcium channel blockers? It's because you have too much calcium in the heart, and therefore you have to take this drug to pull it up. But they're not looking at the whole scene. So we have anxiety, bone pain, insomnia, soft tissue calcium in the kidneys, gallstones, arteries, eyes. Well, what do you think cataracts are? That's calcium. Constipation. Oh, yeah, check this out. Increased urination. Yeah, it's too much calcium. 
There's the condition, if you want to know the name of the condition, it's called hypercalcemia. It's too much calcium in the blood. And you can get it also by taking too much vitamin D because vitamin D will increase in the blood and not taking vitamin K2. So I always recommend taking vitamin K2 with vitamin D3. And then you'll be safe. Cramps, asthma, bronchial spasm, that chronic cough, that's a, a, that's a calcium issue. Um, high blood pressure. But again, you have to look at, do you have enough bile to even digest the fat soluble vitamins? What I'm trying to do is expand your uh, knowledge of the digestive system, the absorption of nutrients, and all the deficiencies that can occur. And then if you have a, a symptom, you know what it means. Gallbladder, the causes of gallbladder issue, high estrogen from heavy periods, giving birth will increase estrogen. Birth control pills, estrogen therapy, environmental estrogens, excessive soy, soy protein isolates, and a lot of the diet um, things that are out there, like for example, I think Metafast, Ideal Protein, it's all soy-based. Uh, it's genetically modified soy. And even if it's not genetically modified, it's still estrogenic. Um, high cortisol, that's stress. So the gallbladder, um, when you get stressed, that can, that can mess with the gallbladder, high estrogen, and also low amounts of vegetables. In college, I think I never ate a vegetable. Um, I justified. I said I'll eat vegetables when I graduate, but nine years later, I didn't eat them. I didn't like them. And now I probably eat more vegetables than any vegetarian that I know. Um, and... Do I like them? I don't even know if I like them. I eat them because I'm such in a habit now, but I just consume them because they're good for me and they make me feel good. That's why I eat them. Um, Low-fat diets. Check this out. Vegetarians have gallbladder problems because, and I'm not saying stop being a vegetarian. I'm just telling you some of the things that if you do it incorrectly could be a problem because I think some people do very well on a vegetarian diet, um, but other people don't. So I'm very flexible with what diet I would put someone on. But guess what stimulates the bile release? Not just the acid stomach, but actual saturated fats. And guess where that comes from? Animal products. So if you get that out of the diet, then all of a sudden your gallbladder dries out and you don't have enough bile. So then you start getting your, your skin gets dry and your vision goes bad, dry hair, all sorts of things. Oh, rancid nuts will irritate the gallbladder too, or ungerminated nuts. Now, <clears throat> what you should do, if you buy raw nuts and you soak them in water and overnight and then rinse them out and then dry them uh, in maybe um, a low temperature in your oven or a dehydrator, uh, that's called germinating. And that will actually help you digest those nuts because that process helps to um, get rid of certain types of things that block digestion. They're called enzyme inhibitors. I know it's a pain in the butt, but um, you know, I will guarantee if you don't do that and you eat nuts, you probably notice your right shoulder start hurting. Solutions: <clears throat> take purified bile salts. Now, the next question is, where does it come from? Um, I knew you were going to ask that. Um, it comes from an ox called ox bile, but we're not giving you um, ox bile. We're giving you just the purified salts of the bile, and that's what your body needs to help build up your own bile. Why? Because bile is recycled, and once you lose it, it's really hard to get it back. Um, so the liver and the gallbladder love vegetables, and they love the kale. Um, kale juice, kale, uh, blended kale juice. So why do you think I, I recommend kale? Because it's really good for the gallbladder and the liver, and I drink it on a regular basis, and I feel really good. So that's some simple solutions for the gallbladder, okay? So um, what I want to do right now is I just want to see, I'll answer some questions. Are raw nut butters okay? Absolutely. Those are totally fun. How do I feel about using Oxbile? I love it. I think it's a really beneficial thing. Um, you speak of ills eating vegetarian diet, however, eating animals in the way that grows them. Okay, yeah. I totally understand that viewpoint that the animals are treated terribly. 
um, and that's a good reason not to consume them. Um, but I, I found that personally with my body and a lot of patients, if they don't do animal products, their health suffers. So um, again, it's just a viewpoint. Um, what foods are good sources of vitamin E? All of the um, vegetables, uh, peas, by the way, are very high in vitamin E. Um, if you have some frozen peas and you eat those, that would be a high in vitamin E. Also, certain nuts, certain seeds that are not rancid are high in vitamin E. Uh, what's the maximum level of D3? Now, realize the international units come in um, our different form. And so on my vitamin D, I use the 10,000 I use. And you might say, wow, that's too much. Yeah, but it's only, it's only like 10 milligrams. It's not that much. And I don't know why they use the international units because they make it sound like it's a, a lot. If you take um, 40,000 I use of D3 and then um, 400 units of K, uh, K2 together, um, you will um, get some serious improvement in your joints and your arteries. So here's the thing. If you have symptoms of calcium, soft tissue calcium, you want to take a little bit more like I take. If you don't, then you can take a little less, like maybe take one of each. But I'll get into the dosing in a little bit. Can you do a keto without a gallbladder? Absolutely. You just might need to take some, um, some pre purified bile salts. Is Epsom salts uh, good for you? Well, Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate, and that will also help with uh, a gallbladder issue because magnesium does relax the bile duct, um, but it's only temporary. That's why I like the bile. Um, does low stomach acid affect irritable bowel syndrome? Yeah, because it's going to be undigested food that's going to end up in your small intestine. So anything, I always like to start with the stomach and work down. What if you don't have a gallbladder? Then you definitely need to do uh, bile salts. Um, yeah, you want to check your blood levels of D3 to make sure it doesn't get out of control. But if you take... Um, some help if you have if your gallbladder is working and you support that and you take k2 you can get away with taking a little bit more d3 and and you need d3 to help um help transport to work with the k2 to transport the calcium um should ca uh, cancer patients supplement with calcium only if they um have a deficiency really i like to get my calcium from food um certain dairy i like uh, grass-fed cheese. I like grass-fed. Um, I like certain types of kefir, but mainly the cheese. That's how I get it. Um, I let's see here. Okay, so wheat germ oil, wonderful for vitamin E, and wheat germ oil does not have does not contain gluten. Okay. So um, all right, now let me just get back to the slide presentation. Okay, let's get to the pancreas. The pancreas, wow, I really plan on going 30 minutes, so I have to go a little faster. Sorry, guys, I don't have that much longer to go, but um, the pancreas is an organ that's underneath the left rib cage. It does two things. It makes all the enzymes to help you digest, but it also uh, helps you um, balance blood sugars because it makes insulin. So the enzymes are those proteins that basically transform food into your body and break down the body into waste. It works with the bile. So in other words, bile only breaks down food to a certain level, and then it's the pancreas enzymes that take it all the way down to the smallest particle. Um, and then, um, so we need both of those things working together. Some of the symptoms from the uh, pancreas are identical to the gallbladder. Um, symptoms statorrhea that's uh, oily sticky stool that sticks to the toilet like the skid marks on the toilet on the bottom of the toilet that means that you have a pancreas problem because you're deficient in the pancreatic enzyme spe specifically lip lipase or lipase um, okay undigested food which causes constipation sluggish bowels that can be a symptom but you see how you can have like you really have to look at if you have one symptom, I can't tell you what to take unless I get the whole picture of what's going on. 
Um, <clears throat> I have certain um, infographics that I'll be putting out this week to help you guys kind of organize all these things easily. Okay, stomach pain, bloating, irritation, gas, similar to the gallbladder, similar to the stomach. Uh, pancreatitis, you could have that if, uh, if there's a, a blockage of the duct. Um, what do you do? For, what do you do to kind of prevent pancreas problems? You need to having some raw foods. I like to have my vegetables mostly raw. Uh, when I eat a salad, I'll do the salad lettuce stuff, but I will always chop up some like red cabbage in there. I'll do some kale. Um, I will. I might do some cauliflower. I always do these additional vegetables in my salads to really just take it to the next level. I don't go. I don't like have the whole thing like that. But I have probably a good, I like a good couple cups. Avoid sugar, okay? That will help your pancreas, I guarantee. Avoiding roasted nuts. Germinate your, soak your nuts and seeds um, because the squirrels um, bury their nuts in the, in the dirt and then they eat them after a while. That sounds really weird, doesn't it? Okay. So um, the enzymes for the pancreas are called um, pan pancreatin. That would be pancreatic enzymes that you could take if you have a pancreas issue. Okay, we're going right to the colon. Your colon, it has, it's like 33 feet of intestine. So we have the small intestine and we have the large intestine. 90% um, of all the digestion occurs in the small intestine. This is where um, you have a lot of friendly bacteria that make enzymes to help you break down a lot of the food. So we, we have about 100 trillion microbes living on and inside our body, um, 10 times the um, amount that uh, you have of cells. So you only have like 10, 000, 10 trillion cells. You have 100 trillion microbes living on your body. Veronica, do you know that only 90% of you is really micro microbes? No. Yeah. That's pretty gross, isn't it? <laughs> So <laughs> microbes are growing right now all over you and inside you. But guess what? They help you. They work with you. You provide a house and they take care, they take the garbage out. <laughs> and they also help make vitamins and they help your immune system as well. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, function, 90% of all the digestion. I just talked about that. They help. Their microbes are mini- Recyclers, they're garbage disposals. Um, when you don't have enough microbes and you're deficient in the bacteria, you get unfriendly bacteria that that grows too much. And this might be a personal question, Veronica, because there's there's only 1,700 people on this webinar. But um, do you have any yeast problems, yeast infections? Um, actually, I did. Okay. So what happens, um, toenail, yeast, uh, chronic halitosis, all this is a deficiency of the good bacteria and an excess of the bad bacteria. In your gut, you have all the, you have 400 different types of strains. You have friendly bacteria, friendly yeast, friendly mold, uh, friendly fungus, and that you need in your body. And without these things, especially if you take antibiotics, you are going to get bloating, constipation, or diarrhea, bad breath, Abdominal pain, cramps, diarrhea, and gas. Other than that, you're going to be totally fine. Solution. What is the solution? The solution is probiotics. I always like the soil-based organisms, microorganisms, because the soil-based uh, probiotics are um, the microbes that will help um, <clears throat> kind of deodorize you, like Good uh, uh, plant-based, or I'm sorry, soil-based organisms, uh, which are called effective microbes, they're liquid. If you take them, when you wake up in the morning, there's no bad breath. Even when you go to the bathroom, there's no, there's no bad odor. In fact, we should have a bottle of this in the um, airports when, before you go in the bathroom because there's like every single person with a digestive problem there. Um, so probiotics are very important and you can even take these uh, liquid probiotics and spray them on your uh, sewage and it just cleans everything up. So it's the same microbes that are in our body that are in the soil. Uh, yogurt is a bit too weak to get your bacteria from, but kefir is way better, but make sure it's plain. And then fermented foods, very, very important. 
fermented foods, and that would be um, like kef uh, like kefir, uh, pickles, sauerkraut. Um, what else? Kombucha. Those are all fermented drinks. Uh, those are really good. Now, I know I have not been answering some questions. Do you recommend the probiotic? Yes, I will in a second. Um, let's see. Toenail yeast. Yeah, what happens when you don't have enough good bacteria, you get overgrowths of bacteria and fungus that can grow on the outside of your body. It's toe, on your skin. That's what I mean is that you're deficient in the good bacteria. Um, yes, I will have this on replay. Yes, and let's see here. I had my colon cut to remove part of my colon. Well, then you definitely need to support the digestive system because um, if you have your colon resected, um, you're going to be always deficient in the surface area, which then you're going to have less microbes. That, that's why we need like a long digestive tract to be able to get a full digestion. Uh, my daughter is having problems with breakouts, with weight. Uh, I would do vitamin A and vitamin E, but just make sure that her diet has those fat soluble vitamins. But she might need help with some bile. Uh, rashes on the skin, well, that would be a vitamin A. I would look for the vitamin A in gallbladder. When you actually support the gallbladder, you really help the skin with so many things because think about all these, these creams that women buy for their skin. They're all fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin E, uh, vitamin A, oils. They're putting it on the outside of the skin, but they're not taking it from the inside out. If you took, like, my daughter, for example, um, Veronica, I sent you a picture of my daughter, right? You, you can't really see her skin, but her skin is like an angel skin. Yes. And that, that's because, you know, she's, her gallbladder is working good and she can pull these nutrients into the skin. And uh, for women, I mean, why put it on the outside when you can take it from the inside out? Good. Let me see if there's another question here. Okay, please explain soil-based. <clears throat> there's different types of microbes out there. There's um, probiotics, there's acidophilus. Um, the type of microbes that I always use and recommend and have uh, are called effective microbes because they can be used in your garden, <laughs> they can be used in your body. And Japan has done a lot of studies over the last few hundred years on these microbes. And they have these blends that work synergistically that are for uh, spraying in um, gardens and different soils to be able to convert them from um, uh, herbicides to an organic free or an organic soil because they can eat up the, the chemicals. So they actually help recycle chemicals in the soil. So these microbes, um, the soil-based microbes are um, doing all the wonderful things of breaking down minerals and then helping the plant absorb it. So our soils are filled with microbes. Well, the same microbes are on the soil or in our body. So there are um, microbes that you can take. They're not going to be called soil-based because the FDA is freaked out about that. They're called effective microbes. Um, okay, good. So now I want to show you. I want to show you something. Let me get back here. Yeah, so there's been some questions. What do I take for this? How do I take that? Where do I get this? I'm going to give you an option of getting a little kit that I put together, um, starting with the gallbladder formula. <clears throat> and you can just get the gallbladder formula. That's fine. But there's a little kit that I'm going to show you. I recently upgraded my gallbladder formula to made it, make it very, very complete. Because not only did I put the purified bile salts in it that's already been in there, but I just recently put the pancreatic enzymes, all it's called pancreatin uh, 4X, which has all those enzymes for the pancreas. Like it's the ultimate digestive um, um, supplement because it handles the pancreas, it handles the gallbladder, it handles the stomach. I put betaine hydrochloride in there, and there's also stone root in there. There's uh, Spanish black radish for the liver. It has slippery elm bark to help lubricate the uh, bile duct. So it's a wonderful uh, product that you take uh, more like a short-term product. Uh, unless you don't have a gallbladder, you need to take it long-term, but you take it as needed. And I always start out with one 
with breakfast and just see how you do. Um, don't take it um, on empty stomach, an empty stomach, take it with food. And then if it helps you, then take one for lunch and one for dinner. You, you might not need it for three meals. You might just need it for the breakfast. So start small, work up. But it's, it's really a complete um, supplement for the gallbladder. But this is a, a webinar discount that I'm going to give you off this little kit. It's kind of a, um, a fat-soluble um, vitamin optimization kit, if you want to call it. So let's start with the gallbladder. I just talked about that. I have the natural K2, and there's several versions of K2. This is the natural one. It's called a MK7. It's from NATO. So it's not from animal products. So K2 is the one we talked about, the calcium transportation. And then we have uh, vitamin D3. This is 10,000 IUs. So what I did is I have the right ratio, so it's always a one-to-one -one ratio between K2 and D3. The only thing I would recommend, though, if you have some major, major, major calcium problems, you may want to take like two-to-one, like twice as much K2 as D3. So if it's a mild problem, I take, take one of these and one of these in the morning with either some butter or your breakfast. If you have symptoms like, I don't know, high blood pressure, calcium issues, stiffness, or even had a stroke, I would take four K2 and four D3. Personally, I take four of each in the morning, and um, you'll find that the, it'll help transport the calcium out of the wrong places. Then we have the probiotic. This is live probiotic flora. And basically, this is the effective microbes I talk about because I got this from Japan. It's a liquid. It doesn't go bad. You keep it outside the refrigerator. You take a half a capful before bed. And I like to put it with a little bit of kefir and slug it before bed. And all night long, it grows on your digestive tract, and it will start to build up your flora, that's the friendly bacteria that is in the, um, in the microbes. So I'm going to also try, I don't know if I can, if this works. Yeah, okay, so if you, if anyone wanted to get this, they can click this and they would get the 20% off automatically. So that's just a link that you can click, but um, it's on the shopping cart, but um, if you're not in the webinar, you don't get the discount. So you'd have to click that to get it. But it's a kit. And then we also, if you get the kit, I'm going to give you this little bonus, which is my mouse pad, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to show you. I have it right here. This is what it looks like right here. This is your kale mouse pad. Mm -hmm. It's uh, pretty cool. So... Um, so anyway, if you wanted to get something, if you wanted to get some fat soluble, a whole kit, you can get it or just get it individually if you want. It's on my website. But here's the thing. The probiotic, that, that is something I don't take um, long term. I'll take it for a couple months and then I won't take it for a month or two. I'll take it for a couple months and I won't take it because once you fortify your body with the microbes, you don't need it anymore. And you know what's interesting? You will just go, you know what? I'm done. I have enough. It's so almost like your body will tell you. The microbes will tell you, I had enough. And um, if it's really, if you have like a lot of antibiotic stuff, you probably take a whole capful. If you have a little child, maybe take a little <clears throat> half a teaspoon and just a little bit in the water. But there's little white specks on there. That is not a bad thing. Those are um, microbes that are clumped together. They're in little colonies. So don't, it's not contaminated. <laughs> So you take half a capful before bed. You can take it in water, a little kefir, and it grows the intestine. And then in the morning, it'll um, like I'll have people that'll take it for like a week, and they'll notice that their their breath is different. Um, they no longer have chronic halitosis. Um, their energy is better, um, and even their digestive system down here is better. Um, unfortunately, the water now has antibiotics. If you do tap water, which I hopefully you don't do that. And we're just bombarded by chemicals. So it's a, it's a high-quality liquid probiotic. Um, the D3 is uh, natural, and that's in a 10,000 IUs. Um, so it's only – actually, it's only one milligram, okay? It's not, it's not 10 milligrams. It's one milligram. So it's not that much. And you take the K2, 
and then the gallbladder, and you can take them together to start to help absorb it. Um, so that's what I'm going to recommend tonight if you have any problems with the digestive system. So as you're looking at, at that, I'm going to continue to answer some questions here. Um, can I call your office with the code and get it tomorrow? Um, yes, of course you can. Um, what I can do is I can, I'll send people the code. Actually, I'm going to see if I can give you the code right now because let me just see if I can do that. Copy. Let's try that right now. Chat. Um, let's see if I could do this. I don't know if that worked. It's there. Is it there? Yeah, FN, FSMP20R. Does it give you the actual code? Yeah, isn't it FSMP20R? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I will just uh, create a, um, this is the code right here. All right, so let me just do this here, backspace. All right, so I'm just, I'll just show people the code if you want to write it down. Screen share. All right, so it's FSNK2O. 20. Off. So it's, that's OFF. Okay, so that's the code that you can use. If there's any questions, you can call my office. But that is the code that you can use. All right. Um, let me see here. All right. So, all right. So now let's see here. Someone's asking about water. The best water to to take would be mineral water um, with uh, ionized calcium and magnesium. I like the Pellegrino. I like the um, I like to read labels and just get the um, like the unique waters. Even I'll do Fuji even because it's like a good mineral water and it's almost sweet to me. And so that's the type of water that I love. That's the best. You can also you know filter your own water and then take electrolytes if you want. I'm going to be doing this seminar, different seminars for the next month every Tuesday on different topics. So that's why this one is the digestive system, but there will be other seminars. But I'm going to have you um, sign up for the additional ones, but because you sign up for this one, you will be able to um, automatically just click a button when I send you the link, and it'll it'll enter your information. So it'll be a real simple way to sign up for next Tuesday. But I wanted to get this stuff out because a lot of this information is based on um, some new books that I'm writing, a book series that I wanted to, you know, see how people like the information, see if it can help them. All right. It says, why do I get acid reflux with apple cider vinegar? I try to take cranberry juice. Well, <clears throat> what happens is that um, there is a condition where you have um, too much lactic acid. That's a waste acid that comes from the small intestine. So if you have a situation where you do not do well with fermented like apple cider vinegar and you get like a sour, then what you need is you need to um, fix the, the waste acid in the lower bowel. So that's what you need the uh, probiotic that I recommended to take in a liquid form to start building up the good bacteria that make lactic acid. The good microbes make acids to help you protect you against the um, unfriendly microbes. The my unfriendly microbes can't live in that acidic environment. Your intestines, especially the large intestine, is very acidic. So... Um, you, and that's because the microbes make lactic acid to help you digest and also to help kill off microbes. So we need that nice balance of acid, and that's why you need sometimes you need to take microbes because it'll start to counter that. Um, so there are people that don't do well with that, and that's because the problem is coming from the lower bowel. Do you ship to Australia? Yes, I do. What about alkaline water? Absolutely not. Only if it's naturally made alkaline water. But the machines, I don't recommend it. Because I'll check people with a pH of a 9, 
that's like way, way too high of the urine, and that's because they're drinking all this alkaline water. Um, I don't know if I could show you this. This is a this is a book I keep these in my office. This is an endocrine book. I'm going to turn to the adrenal right here, and you can see that the adrenal, if you can see that, causes alkalosis. So stress makes you too alkaline in your blood. Your urine might be too acid because you're losing acids. You're losing acids from your stomach. So when you check the urine, you're like highly acidic, but you're really generating an alkaline internal blood, and that's alkalosis. And so as soon as you start doing the alkaline water, you start, remember we talked about pH, <clears throat> you start destroying the stomach, you alkalize the stomach. So now you can't pull the minerals. Now you don't have the electrolytes. Now you feel dizzy. Now the adrenals go down. Um, now you get cramps, and then you can't sleep. See, if you're feeling very hyped up and you can't wind down easily, it's like an electrolyte problem. Um, what is the uh, symptom of gallbladder polyps? Well, polyps <clears throat> um, are like a mini tumor. And tumors are triggered by things that are cause an anabolic effect. And that would mainly be, there's a couple hormones that are anabolic. One is estrogen, and number two is insulin. So the most common cause for polyps is usually an insulin polyp, and that's coming from eating a little too much sugar. If you want to get rid of polyps, just avoid all sugars and read the labels. Oh, yeah, my, someone asked, does my probiotic, um, does it go through the stomach? Yes, it does. None of, that, none of those microbes are destroyed at the stomach level. One of the microbes in my probiotic is called, um, it's called, Pseudomona, Pseudomona pulsarius. That microbe can grow in lava. Isn't that wild? It can grow in lava. It doesn't get killed. I mean, like, it'll survive anything. So uh, there are microbes that live in the clouds. I mean, live in the bottom of the ocean. So it's a very uh, complete, there's 400 strains in that probiotic. So when you take it, it's like, it's going to, slowly over time balance out your your flora and it um i mean there's a lot of different effects that'll create for joints uh for less waste in your gut more regular bowel movements um it lubricates the colon does a lot of things um baking soda for stomach problems absolutely not because that's going to alkalize your stomach and you don't want to take baking soda it'll give you a little bit of relief but then it cre create a lot of problems yeah. down the road. Just like you, Veronica, when you took the um, antiacids, you probably noticed that uh, you felt good for a second, and then it got worse. Is that true? Yes, that's it's, that's completely correct. Yeah. Yeah, because you just alkalize your stomach. You feel better, and then you feel worse, and then you're like, "Oh my gosh, my stomach is killing me!" Right? So. <clears throat> I just finally got through all my slides, and I want to know if you guys liked the webinar. Did you learn anything? Oh, sorry, the ratio of K2. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, K1 to K2. Okay, so how many do you need? Um, personally, I take four K2 and four D3 in the morning every single day. Why? Because I have a history of a lot of spurring. I don't, I'm trying to find my... If I had my x-rays around here, I'll show you. I have spurring all of my neck and back from injuries um, from motorcycle accidents and things like that. And But other people take it maybe for their blood pressure, so it would be four to four. If, for example, you might have, you just want to prevent issues, just take one and one. But the K2 is really good for creating elasticity into the arteries and the joints. And also, if any one of you take any of my vitamins or anything and you have a question about how many I should take, you can always call my office and ask me personally. I will leave a message and tell you what to take based on your history. But I'll probably need you to give a little history on what's going on. I don't like the alkaline water machines. No, I don't. Honey, now, uh, you don't want to take honey because it's uh, 
basically too many um, too many sugars unless you don't want to lose weight if you don't want to lose weight a little bit of tupelo honey is not a bad thing organic coffee I'm not against a small amount of coffee that's the worst of your problems it's like if you want to do that just make sure the cream is organic and make sure that the um, the sugar is xylitol and not regular sugar or if you want to use some honey but if you're trying to lose weight that's not a good idea all right so I want to just say thank you for all of you that actually stayed on this long because I went overboard by an hour again and I want to. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some great data. So I want you to apply what you learned. And I'm looking forward to talking to you next Tuesday night, same time, same place. We're going to cover even some more in-depth information about uh, cortisol. So thank you. Wonderful comments. Ver uh, Veronica, did you learn anything? I did. Okay, good. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you for coming on here. Um, I still want to um, kind of help you tweak. I think now we have to deal with your gallbladder because I, we've been working on the stomach. Now it's the gallbladder and work our way down. But um, we just have to get the, the food right. So I want to thank everyone for coming on. I appreciate your attention and your interest. And uh, again, um if you wanted to get the kit go ahead and click it i don't even know if it's posted anymore maybe it is is that is it posted somewhere in there yeah so anyway um have a wonderful night it's time to go to bed and for me and uh i will see all of you very very soon and thanks, Veronica. Thank you. You're welcome.